This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. It is a good day when our two congregations are together. And today we have the opportunity to worship together. My name is Amy Miracle, and I'm the pastor at Broad Street Presbyterian Church. And I am delighted that this congregation and Bethany Presbyterian Church are together today, especially during these challenging, confusing times. It is good for us to be together. Amen. Uh, bless you, Pastor Amy. You're so um, correct. It is good for us to be together. God has placed us here together, and it is only, um, I think, a reflection of God's will that we come together and worship as one body. And I certainly, as a pastor of Bethany Presbyterian Church, want to um, offer what Stephanie Spellers called a radical welcome. And what that means is with our whole hearts, as we, we're going to open up and receive you and embrace you in hopes that you feel welcome, in hopes that you feel loved, in hope that you feel supported, in hope, most of all, you feel the love of Christ. So we love you, bless you, each and every one of you all, and we hope and pray that during this hour, you feel welcome to be in our presence. I agree with everything you just said, Edward. Uh, also want to be sure to invite everyone to a Zoom coffee hour. Um, members of both congregations are invited, and that Zoom link was shared in the ways we usually share these things in our two congregations. Um, so let us begin. Let Amen. us worship God. Amen. Bless you.
Good morning, kids at Bethany Presbyterian, and good morning, kids at Broad Street Presbyterian Church. My name's Miss Brittany, and I'm here to lead the children's time. When I was thinking about our two churches, our neighboring churches, and this children's time, I thought of this book that I really like by Sesame Street. We're different, we're the same, and we're all wonderful. I wanted to read just a couple pages from this book so that we can hear what I'm talking about. We're different. Our noses are different. We're the same. Our noses are the same. They breathe and sniff and sneeze and whiff. Our hair is different. Our hair is the same. It grows on us in several places and it warms our heads and frames our faces. Our skin is different. Our skin is the same. It tells us something's cold or hot or wet or dry. It knows a lot. Muscles and bones are wrapped inside it. We all have blood and skin to hide it. It keeps in warmth. It keeps out dirt. It warns us so we don't get hurt. Our feelings are different. Can you see the different feelings? Our feelings are the same. Lonely, worried, scared, excited, happy, loving, glad, delighted. I wanted to add just a couple pages to this book of my own. So here are a few pages I'm adding. Our pastors are different. Our pastors are the same. They care for the sick, teach us about the Bible, and lead their churches. Our buildings are different. Our buildings are the same. We use them to worship with prayers, singing, and reading the Bible. Our people are different. Our people are the same. They want to get closer to God and to serve their neighbor. Broad Street and Bethany Presbyterian churches are the same and they are different. That's what makes the church such fun. There are many kinds of people in churches, not just one. A rainbow would be boring if it were only green or blue. What makes a rainbow beautiful is that it has every hue. So aren't you glad you, like, you look like you and your churches look like yours? We're different, we're the same. We're all Wonderful. Let us pray, repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for the ways we're different. Thank you for the ways we're the same. Amen.
our reading this morning is a segment of Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus. So then, putting away falsehood, let all of us speak the truth to our neighbors, for we are members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and do not make room for the devil. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up as there is need, so that your words may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with which you were marked with a seal for the day of redemption. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and slander together with all malice and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I was one of the speakers at my high school graduation. And in my words, I quoted the 19th century French author, George Sand. Humanity is outraged in me and with me. Let us not dissimulate nor try to forget this indignation, which is one of the most passionate forms of love. Now, I readily admit that this is an odd choice to be included in a Midwestern high school graduation. Uh, kind of obscure um, and, and um, hard to follow. It, it's not the kind of quote that you can easily remember and repeat to others later. But the quote makes the claim that anger is a form of love. Now, I quoted it, but I, don't, I didn't really understand it. I was a senior in high school and thought I knew everything. I, I used this quote as a springboard to talk about all the injustices of high school. Now, for the life of me, I, I can't remember what those injustices were. Uh, too much homework, bad cafeteria food, unflattering gym uniforms. I don't recall, but I do remember that I was very passionate in my anger. And that's okay, because there it is right in the scriptures. Be angry, Paul says. We have biblical permission to be angry. And that's a good thing because anger can be a very helpful emotion. It gets the blood flowing. It sets the mind racing. It is one of the best motivators around. Perhaps all movements for social change um, from the Boston Tea Party to the Civil Rights Movement to Black Lives Matter have been initiated and fueled by a reservoir of righteous anger. Anger has its purpose. It's okay to be angry. In the Ephesians te text, it's practically a command, be angry. I mean, finally, a biblical edict that it's easy for us to follow because there's so much in our world, so many reasons to be angry. So let me tell you what makes me angry, and please keep in mind this is a very abbreviated list. Uh, people who don't use their turn signals to change lanes or make a left turn. Uh, ATM fees, the whole idea of the designated hitter. I'll, I'll tell you what makes me angry. Rules that stifle creativity and vision. People who prey on the weak and vulnerable. People who hurt children. Oh, and I'm just getting started. On January 6th, as I watched events unfold at our nation's capital, I experienced a vast array of emotions, disappointment, skepticism, incredulity, cynicism, hopelessness, sadness, and anger. Lots of anger. I'm still working my way through all that. I'm still processing that anger. Listening for what it has to teach me about what matters, what is important. Because anger at its healthiest, at its healthiest, helps us 
to identify injustice and gives us the energy to work towards God's vision for justice. Anger is a healthy, positive, appropriate emotion. Except when it is not. There is such a thing as inappropriate anger. We've all seen it, experienced it, been on the receiving end of it, been the one doling it out. There's a reason that anger made it onto the list of the seven deadliest sins. When I am angry, really angry, I feel strong and powerful. I feel articulate and resolute. Anger can be deliciously intoxicating. Forgive and forget, <laughs> not on your life. Turn the other cheek, not a chance. And give up this glorious feeling of self-righteousness. Recently, I found myself following a woman into a grocery store. She was talking on her cell phone. And, no, that's, that's not right. She was yelling into her cell phone. She was furious at the person on the other end. Uh, she called them names. She belittled them. She reminded them several times of everything that they had done wrong. Every word dripped venom. And for a minute or two that I followed her, she never let up. As far as I could tell, she never took a breath. It was one unrelenting wall of anger. We know what unhealthy anger sounds like, looks like, feels like. So how do we avoid unhealthy anger without slipping into some bland agreeableness? We should say what we believe, express what we think, even when to do so is unpopular. But how do we do that and still remain connected to one another? That's the tricky part. How do we express our opinions with energy and passion and still live together in a family, in a church, in a nation? To use Paul's language, how can we be angry and not sin? Aristotle wrote, anybody can become angry, that is easy. But to be angry with the right person and to the right degree and at the right time and for the right purpose and in the right way, that is not within everybody's power. That is not easy. That's an understatement, Aristotle. Nothing about this is easy. But Paul has some helpful words to say on this subject. Paul is writing to a church that evidently has experienced a fair amount of conflict and disagreement. And Paul suggests that anger and truth-telling are an essential part of being in community. But then he adds some other essentials. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. Now, did you notice that nowhere in the reading does Paul say that we should be nice? Being nice is, is not a virtue. Uh, being a Christian is not about getting along with everyone. No one ever taught Paul that if you can't say anything nice, you shouldn't say anything at all. Now, he knows that when real people live in real community with one another, they will discover real dis disagreement and experience real discord. But when that happens, Paul says, don't be quiet and disappear. Speak the truth. Be angry and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as Christ has forgiven you. Paul suggests that community is formed and held together through both truth and love, anger and forgiveness, indignation and tenderness. For Paul, that and is really important. For a community to be healthy and whole, it needs the and. It's in the and that marriages are strengthened and families are mended and communities are repaired. So what does it look like to live in the land of the and? What does it feel like to live in, in a community where we can be both angry and also forgive? 
where truthful opinions are expressed and kindness is expressed as well. Well, maybe you already know what it is like to live in an and world. Maybe you have an and friend, someone who will look you in the eye and tell you when you are messing up and five minutes later be pouring you a cup of coffee and listening to you with compassion and understanding. Such friends are invaluable and help us to more fully grow into the people that God, that God hopes and intends us to be. With good friends, it's easy to offer that and in return, to be honest and helpful. But when a person makes us angry, really angry, um, it can be hard to turn around and be tender and kind and forgiving. The only role model I can think of for all this is God, because we worship an and God, um, one who was full of clarity and disappointment at our failings, and even more full of tender mercy and unlimited forgiveness. But God is God, and we are not. And for us mere mortals, getting past anger is very difficult. He doesn't think women should be ministers, I, I was, had been told. He doesn't come to church when he knows you're preaching, someone said to me. He doesn't think of you as a real pastor, someone else said. So I wrote him off. It's not so much that I avoided him, I, I just never sought him out. But when I did think of him, I became angry. And this day and age, how could anyone write you off simply because of your gender? And then the day came when he could no longer come to church. And I knew that I needed to visit him and his wife. But my first thought was, he never thought of me as a real pastor, so why should I be his pastor now? Well, fortunately, I had a second thought. I would visit him because it was my job to do so. Uh, and it was the right thing to do. But I went with a very bad attitude, fully expecting that I would be treated with rudeness. I was completely and utterly wrong. I was, I was met by someone who was gracious beyond my imagining. What I found was a keen mind and interesting conversation. What I received was a warm welcome. The hour passed quickly and I left that day with a book in hand and the promise to return in a month's time. But let's be clear, I, I got lucky on that one. I got past my anger because my job required me to visit him. Um, it's hard to move past anger. I'm not sure we can do it. I'm not sure we can do both, truth and love, anger and forgiveness, indignation and tenderness, strong opinions and kindness. Now, I may be putting too much faith in a conjunction. Conjunctions are, are little insignificant words. They aren't used to all this attention. They can't hold up under the strain. And is a very humble word, small, and seemingly unimportant, and yet it holds so much together. Does that sound like anyone you know? The and reminds me of Jesus. In the eyes of the world, he was insignificant, an unimportant man living out his life in an unimportant town, and yet God's power, majesty, and grace worked in him and through him, and he redeemed the whole world. Jesus and the and have much in common. I'm thinking that behind the and is Jesus. No, the and is Jesus. We should treat one another with honesty and with kindness. Who, where is Jesus in that sentence? Jesus is the and. What enables us to be both truthful and loving is Jesus. Jesus' love, Jesus' truthfulness, Jesus' forgiveness of us, his grace, his guidance. The only way we can do both is with the help of Jesus. So be truthful and loving. Be angry and kind. 
because that's how God treats us. And with the help of our Lord and Savior, that's how we can treat one another. Amen. Shall we bow our heads for a word of prayer as we come together as a faith community and look to God for help, for strength, for encouragement, to inspire us, to give hope, peace, and love. Shall we bow our heads? God, in your name, we thank you, we praise you, we magnify you, we lift you up in our hearts. You said that we could come together and beseech you in times of need, in times we are lacking in strength, in times when we need encouragement and we need a presence and light of hope. And it is at this hour we come to you um, as your people in order to say thank you for all that you have done for us. We thank you for your healing. 
We thank you for giving us joy in times when we have felt sorrow. We just come to you and thank you for the encouragement that you have given us in times we have felt hopeless. We ask that as we come together as a faith community, that your presence would be felt as those gather with us in this service. Help us, God, to reflect that love that you have bestowed upon the world. For you have said, for God so loved the world that you gave your only begotten Son, that whomsoever shall believe it shall not perish, but shall have everlasting life. Our hope is in you. We look up to you. For the psalmist says, we look up into the hills from which cometh our help. And we know this day our help comes from the Lord. Give us strength as we go into this season, looking and listening, watching and praying um, as we are led by your Holy Spirit. Be in this service and just surround us with your arms of protection and your arms of strength, your arms of, of power, um, your arms of hope. Bless you, God. Once again, we lift you up, we give you the praise, and we thank you for all that you have done. You have forgiven us of all of our sins, and you have cleansed us from all unrighteousness. And forever, you, we will give you the praise. This we pray, as you have taught the disciples to pray, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
what a gift, what a wonderful gift when God's people worship together. We invite you to extend that gift and deepen it at the Zoom coffee hour at 1045. Bethany, use the regular link. Broad Street, use the link you received yesterday. And now receive the benediction. Go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Put your faith in action. We are different and we are the same. By grace, be angry and forgiving, strong and kind, truthful and loving. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the powerful presence of the Holy Spirit be with you all this day and in the days to come. Amen.